Uh, so thanks so much for, for coming to the first of uh, three uh, uh, keynote sessions at uh, SOE 2017. And we're really happy to have uh, Matt Jackson. I actually got his, I've got his, uh, Matt, so just see what he looks like. I've got him, oh, there he is. There's Matt, there's his book. He tells me he's going to have a new book called The Human Network coming out next soon, I guess at the end, end of, end of uh, the summer. So once you've worked your way through this book, he's going to have a, a, a version that you can actually all understand. I don't understand this book. It's a little bit too hard for me. Um, but he's going to explain some of these things today. I've actually known, I, one of the things I have this, I, I've known Matt for a long time, actually. And one of the ways I knew him, I guess you see these little things over here. He actually tells me he still has a scar the last time he went mountain biking with me, apparently. <laughs> so um, even though I, I, I put him in the hospital, he still agreed to come and do this talk today. So we're very grateful to have him. He's, uh, he's a William D. Elberly Professor of Economics at Stanford University and an external faculty member at the Santa Fe Institute and senior fellow at CIFAR. He's off, in fact, he almost didn't come. He's off to Zurich uh, in a few hours to uh, carry out his duties at CIFAR. He got his PhD from Stanford in 1988, and he works on game theory, microeconomic theory, the study of social and economic uh, networks, and he's also worked on, um, he has his book, as I've shown you, he teaches an online course, so he has a very, I think, how many people you had in your online, 600,000? <laughs> he's one of the most popular professors in the world, okay? And so you guys are very lucky, well, maybe, you're one of many people who get to enjoy his presence. <laughs> <laughs> so, but we're so happy to see him in person rather than on TV. Um, he's a member of the National Academy of Science, a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Science, a fellow of the Econometric Society, Economic Theory Fellow, and other, other honors include the Von Neumann Award, Guggenheim Fellowship, and the Social Choice and Welfare Prize. For, I, what I can say personally, for somebody so famous and important, he's a really, really nice guy, and I, I was so delighted that he agreed to come and give this talk to us today. So what I'd like to do is give us a warm welcome to Matt Jackson talking about social networks. <laughs> so thank you very much, Bentley. It's a great pleasure to be here, and, and uh, I'm uh, really honored to be part of this. So um, I'm going to talk about networks and institutions, and I'll start with just a little... Bentley asked me to give you a little bit of an overview of, of, of some of what's been going on in the uh, networks literature, and then I'll, I'll go through a few projects, and then I'll drill more deeply into a couple of them. Um, and so, you know, the reason that, that a lot of people in social sciences are interested in, in networks is the fact that they control um, access to information that people have, they control opportunities, um, they influence people's behavior, they, they are the way in which we coordinate with other people. There's a whole series of, of different uh, levels at which they're important. And there's been a, a lot of uh, application areas that are, are, are growing now because you know, people's network structures influence the way they behave and understanding the behavior outside of that context is, is difficult. And so, um, you know, labor and education have been at it for quite a while. Um, going back to um, George Schultz in the 1950s, um, looking at job contact networks, peer effects, um, increasingly understanding how networks impact what opportunities people have for employment and, and how that impacts their, their decisions to become educated and what wages they see and why we see persistent inequality between different groups. Um, it's been making inroads in development, uh, especially in terms of social learning and, and why people take up uh, different programs. And I'll spend some time today talking about an application and development. Um, but there's sort of a long list of things in, in corruption, crime, um, learning teams, alliances, uh, shop, uh, shock propagation. So I'll go through just a few ideas of, uh, of how we study these things, and then I'll, I'll work on a few examples to, to take you in more deeply. So I'll start with just a few pictures of, of what I'll be talking about today. Um, so this is a, a picture from the Ed Health data set. These are, are students in a high school. Um, they're color-coded by race. And you can begin to see um, here there's a, a, a link between two individuals if they've participated in at least three activities in a given week. So these are sort of strong friendships. And you begin to see when you look at a picture like this that there's a segregation pattern within the school. And so even if you built a fairly diverse school, once you start looking inside, it might not be as diverse as the school looks uh, on paper. And so the endogeneity of the peer effects makes a big difference in, in what kinds of behaviors you begin to see. And so you can begin to study things like this and, and look at 
um, what, what the choices are of, uh, of the given students in terms of how much they are going to, to work in terms of becoming educated, uh, what their GPAs look like, what their trajectories are going outside of this. Um, I'm involved in a project now where we're working with uh, data from a large um, social media platform where we're tracking people's um, interactions and exactly what they're doing uh, going out and you can begin to see patterns like this play out in, in more detail. Um, and so th this is an example of what uh, sociologists have referred to as homophily, where you begin to see um, strong schisms in the, in the network um, where people are, are identifying more with people of their own race than, than across races. Um, I'll show you a you know, very different application. You can begin to look at, say, political alliances. Um, this is a picture of military alliances in 1910. Um, this is out of a project with Stephen Nye. Um, here, you can begin to see it's a fairly sparse network. Um, 1940s, you can see again a fairly sparse network. If you look in uh, current times, the network has changed dramatically. Um, you know, statistics now, uh, countries uh, used to have on average about two connections per country. Those connections turned over every decade, so you had about a two-thirds chance of it lasting five years. Um, now, countries have on average about ten alliances. Um, there's about a 95% chance that it lasts 10 years. Uh, it's changed dramatically, and, and actually that correlates very heavily with, with increases in trade. And not surprisingly, um, although you might not know it from, from watching uh, the news, um, the world is much more peaceful than it used to be. So the, the, the incidence of wars over that same time period has gone down by a factor of 10. So you, know, you can begin to look at these structures and try and understand what's driving the alliance structures and, and how is that um, being impacted by trade patterns uh, and, and why is that making changes in, in um, world peace. And, and you know, then you begin to get a little more worried about things like Brexit when you see them happening, um, when you take a perspective that these alliances are actually fairly instrumental in, in decreasing incidence of, of war. So that's a very different application. Um, Another application, we can begin to look at, at financial interactions between uh, different entities. This is from a paper with Matt Elliott and, and Ben Golub. And you know, looking at these kinds of things, you can begin to understand what the risks are of contagion from one uh, default, say, in, in uh, Greece. Um, what are the dangers of that? Which institutions do you have to worry about? Uh, how, how do you insulate that? Um, so these are another application where where this is a, a growing area. A lot of central bankers now are beginning to use network-based measures and simulations to try and understand where they should be uh, regulating and, and how they should be regulating financial institutions. So this is another area of, uh, where there's a lot of activity. Um, this is out, out of the book that, that um, Bentley mentioned that's forthcoming uh, next year. Um, this is actually from code from Renzo Lucioni, who's a computer scientist. And what this uh, represents, these are senators in the US. Um, this is from 1990. And there's a, a link between two senators if they voted the same way on at least half the bills in a given um, meeting of Congress. So this is about a little over 300 votes. And if you look back to 1990, you see that about 82% of the Congress of the senators voted the same way on, on at least half the bills. Um, if you look in 2015, the picture is different. So if you have some perception that the world is becoming a little bit more polarized, um, the data suggests that that's true. Um, here you see about 53% of, the, of them are linked. And I didn't, you know, I, did, I didn't purposely pull this apart. This was <laughs> done, um, this is done by a computer program where what it does is it puts the, the the points down and then it adjusts them based on how strongly they're linked. And so it, it, it pulled them apart. And actually it pulled Rubio, Cruz, and Graham out as well. Um, so there's certain senators who don't <laughs> act like other senators. Um, and you, know, you begin to see patterns by looking at this. And, and, you, and there, there are explanations for these patterns. So you can dig into the data more deeply and try and understand how people's opinions are being formed, what's influencing them, and why you're beginning to see this kind of polarization. And of course, there's economic fundamentals that are, that are at, at work. Um, but also, you can look at the network patterns of interactions. And here, um, following what media people are following and, and where they're getting their news sources, um, they're becoming increasingly homophilistic in that dimension, and you're beginning to see uh, policies um, diverge in, as well. So, so the, uh, that's something that uh, I'll be talking about more in terms of the book. 
Um, so what, what I want to spend most of the time today on is talking about the interaction between informal relationships and formal institutions. And this will give you more of a feeling of, about how we work with networks and, and sort of roll up our sleeves in working with some of the data. And in particular, you know, formal markets and informal relationships interact. They substitute for each other. So I'll talk a little bit about loans today. Um, so you know, if you, if you have access to formal credit, you don't necessarily have to rely on your friends and family for loans. That's going to change the way that people borrow. Um, but they also complement each other. So spread of information about how to interact um, affects the functioning of, of formal institutions. And so both of these affect economic behaviors and welfare. And you know, there are studies of how social norms and institutions interact, but it's still an area where I think there's, there's a lot to be added. And, and so that's most of the focus of what I'll do today, is talk about how network structures interact with formal institutions. And in particular, I'm going to talk about sort of a decade-long study I've been doing with Abhijit Banerjee, Arun Chandra Sikhar, and Esther Duflo. And for, for roughly 10 years, we've been working in India, gathering data in uh, Karnataka, so southern India, and there'll be sort of two main questions that we'll focus in on today. And the first is, how do informal networks affect the, the take up of formal loans? So if you want to get loan products out there, you want to get people uh, taking advantage of available credit, a fairly reasonable credit source for them, how do you get that out? And then the second part is, once you do get that out, how does that change the society? And so does that change the way that people interact? And does that, the fact that these substitute for, for informal loans mean that that's going to change the social fabric? And so what I'll do is, first of all, show you that the, the informal networks will affect whether the loans are taken up. And then secondly, I'll show that, that if the loans are taken up, that affects what the networks look like afterwards. <coughs> so both of these things are going to interact with each other, and, and that's sort of the main theme of, of the talk today. Okay, so just in terms of a preview, what I'll do is I'll go through data and background, then I'll talk about the networks affect the, the formal institutions, and basically this was a word of mouth diffusion process, and so the centrality of the first people that they talked to is important in determining how successful this was. And then secondly, I'll talk about the, the sort of the latest part of what we're doing with this study, is now seeing that the formal institutions are driving changes in the informal networks. And here there's things that we didn't really expect. So the, the, um, what we expected to happen was the, the inflow of capital would actually stimulate the networks, but instead what we're seeing is the networks are actually dissolving a bit. And in particular, we're going to see a, a drop in, in informal relationships among the people who participate in the loans, and then we're going to see a drop in the informal relationships among people who don't participate in the loans as well. So there's going to be spillovers, and generally you're going to see less and less interaction both between people who are in the loan program and who people who are not. And um, we'll also see this spill over into other types of interactions that don't involve borrowing and lending, but involve things like advice networks and uh, informal favor exchange, and uh, so that a whole series of different networks will also be affected in a similar way. So that'll sort of be the main uh, analysis that we'll go through. Okay. So outline, I'll start with some data. I'll talk about how m networks affected loan diffusion and then how loan diffusion changes networks. Okay, so the, the background here was that uh, microfinance, there was a microfinance organization going into villages in southern India. They're trying to get information out about the availability of loans. And they did it by word of mouth. And I, I don't have time today to tell you why they did it by word of mouth. But basically, they went in and they looked for people that they thought were central in the networks. They told them about the program. And they said, tell your friends. And that was the way they spread news about the availability of loans. And then they went back in. And then they tried to get people to, to show up. And the people that they talked to were teachers, self-help group leaders, and shopkeepers. So they thought these would be people who would be well connected in the villages. But what they were finding is that in some villages, they were getting close to zero participation, and in others, they were getting about half of eligible households participating. In our data, it goes from about 7% minimum to about 44% maximum. And these were villages that looked pretty identical. So the question is, why are they getting very different take-up rates in otherwise looking identical villages? And um, we'll, we'll, you know, the answer is going to be 
the seeds, actually their positions in the network, made a difference in who ended up being aware of the microfinance. And so I'll just take you through that first part of the study, and uh, we can look at that in some detail. So um, 75 villages, rural Karnataka, relatively isolated, so the bank was picking these because they didn't have microfinance originally. The bank entered 43 of these villages. Those are the ones we'll look at in the first part. Um, the nice part about this was there was an accident that happened from our perspective, which was that the financial crisis hit in 2009. And so they had planned to go into all 75 villages. They stopped after the four, first 43. They had uh, financial constraints. And so they left the other 32 untouched. And so we'll do a, a diff and diff by looking at the 43 they entered compared to the 32 they did not. And that'll uh, allow us to understand what the impact of, uh, of microfinance was. And I'll talk about that a little bit later. Okay, so the loans, um, these are 10,000 rupee loans. So that's roughly $200. They're 50 week loans. They're given to women between the ages of 18 and 55 years old. Um, one per household, so if, they, if you have multiple uh, women in, within that age range, which a lot of households do, you could still only take one per household. They basically, any household who showed up got a loan, with the exception of uh, households which had only one woman and no, no men in the household. They, would, they often refused those households, so widowed uh, households uh, were the ones that were left out. These are Grameen style, so they were given um, to groups of five women at a time, and then if any one of the women defaulted, they were all called into default, okay? Um, the interest rates, 30% or so, seems high, um, but by the standards, the money lenders there are charging usually about 47%, 47 to 50%, so these are reasonably uh, good um, loan terms, and uh, the repayment rate was about 99% in terms of the, the villages, so, so they were, um, attractive for the microfinance institution if they could get enough take up of these. Okay, so here we are, rural Karnataka. The villages are fairly poor villages, about a dollar per capita income, um, mostly agricultural. There's some finger millet, um, they, they, uh, some dairy production, silkworm production, uh, you know, some day laboring. So these are relatively poor villages and what we did is before the <coughs> microfinance organization went in, we went into the villages and mapped out the networks, the informal relationships between the individuals. And we did this by surveying households, and in fact, surveying most of the adults. And so here, um, what you can see is this is one of the villages. Each one of these little dots is an adult, and they're clumped into households. And then this is a question of if you had to borrow 50 rupees for a day, who would you go to? So this is a, an informal borrowing network. And um, you know, there's an arrow between one node and another if they answered that they would go to this person. We also asked who's come to you to borrow um, uh, 50 rupees in the past. Um, we had questions about who do you go to temple with? Who do you go to when you have a uh, need for important advice? Who comes to you to borrow kerosene or rice? Who do you go to to borrow kerosene and rice? Who do you go to in an emergency for medical help? So this is a way of eliciting the informal relationships. You can begin to see that these networks differ from one another. Some of them are denser, some are, are sparser. They'll answer uh, different, differently on different questions. But overall, what we're gonna do is put all these networks together and then we'll have a network of which households interact with which other households. And the idea here is that if, if they answered yes on any of these questions, then information could flow from one to another, okay? Okay, we also have a lot of demographics. If you look at one of these, these were just sort of put up with households in fixed areas. It's hard to see what the patterns in this network are. Here, instead, I've taken the same network. This is the kerosene, uh, one village, kerosene and rice, and these are now color-coded by caste group. So this is the blue are scheduled caste, scheduled tribes. So these are the relatively poor castes. Um, the red are the relatively advantaged castes. And you can begin to see now, there's about a 9% chance that any two households within the same caste designation are linked, and about uh, uh, a six-tenths of a percent chance that they're linked 
across groups. So there's a, about a 15 times higher chance that you're, you're interacting within these cast groups. And you can also begin to see, you know, here, for instance, there's a, a cast group which doesn't interact with this one. Um, so there's, there's finer groupings. That's going to make a difference in how information diffuses. So if you only hit part of this village, you might not get full diffusion. And so the, the location of where you seed information in terms of who you tell about uh, microfinance availability is going to make a difference in how this spreads out and whether or not you get full take up. Okay. Most of the villages are, are heavily cast dependent and, and you'll see similar patterns in most of them. Okay. So let me talk a little bit about how the networks mattered in loan diffusion. So um, there's a, a literature that goes back through sociology, um, computer science, um, economics, that has looked at uh, the fact that, you know, seeding uh, diffusion process, it makes a difference. If you seed it with different seeds, you can get different outcomes. Um, I won't go through the, the details of this, but here, let me just give you some ideas here from the literature. You know, the, the most obvious thing to do if you want to seed information is, you know, find the most popular nodes. So find the ones with the most connections. So if you wanted to go on Twitter, you'd go to Katy Perry, right? So she's, um, she's, she's got millions of followers. Um, information spreads out w widely. So the idea is you look for the highest degree nodes, and those are going to be people who have the most connections, um, who can reach the most individuals. Uh, so that goes back to Simmel uh, over a century ago. So this is called degree centrality in the networks literature, whereas degree just means how many connections do I have? Okay, what's the problem with degree centrality? Um, well, if we look at a network like this, you begin to see here's two different nodes that both have degree two, and obviously one of them is much better connected than the other. This one has a, a friend who has a six and a seven. This has two friends that are both twos. So there's a, a sense in which this one is much better placed to be spreading information than the other one. Whereas if you just count degree, you won't pick that up. Okay. So what you want is you want an idea that says a person is more central, not just because they have more connections, but because they're better connected to people who have better connections, right? Okay, um, this is what's known as eigenvector centrality. So the idea here of eigenvector centrality is that you make somebody's centrality, if I look at person I, I look at their centrality, instead of making it proportional to how many friends they have, I'm going to make it proportional to the sum of their friends' centralities. Okay, so the idea is now I've got this system of equations and unknowns. My centrality is dependent on my friend's centrality. Their centrality is dependent on their friend's centrality and so forth. This is basically an, uh, an eigenvector calculation. So now if I look at um, a network where I, I code up a, a matrix to say gij is one if two people are connected and zero otherwise, then this calculation becomes that the, the vector of centralities is proportional to the network uh, matrix, adjacency matrix times the centrality measure. So this is what's known as eigenvector centrality. It's, it's something that goes back into the, to the 1970s um, in, in the sociology literature, and it's another way of, of capturing centrality. If you go back to these nodes, here you see now this one's a 0 0.3, 0.31, this one's a 0 0.11, so it's capturing an idea that this one is somehow three times more central than the other one, once we account for the fact that its friends are more central and so forth. And then this one is the most central node, even though it's not the highest degree node, because it's better placed in terms of the overall reach it has. Okay? So for spreading information, maybe eigenvector centrality might be a better measure than the, the, the one we started with of just counting how many friends you have. Okay. So um, for our study, what we did was instead of just looking at these sort of off-the-shelf kinds of measures, we thought, well, if we're trying to diffuse microfinance, why don't we think about what that process looks like? How does information pass from one node to another? And let's model that explicitly. Okay? So we're going to do a very simple model, which looks a lot like an epidemiological model of, of simple contagion, where things are just going to, the, the awareness is just going to spread from one household to another. And so we'll have two moving parts to this. We'll call this diffusion centrality. And the idea is, let's look at some, how many nodes end up informed if some node is initially informed. And then each informed node tells its neighbor with some probability p in each period. And this process lasts for some, some time period. So say t is equal to 3 would mean, you know, after three iterations we get tired and we stop talking about it. 
So if you look at Twitter, for instance, most things are within 18 hours. You're sort of a boom, things are retweeted, then it's, it's just dead. Um, so there's, you know, there's time periods where people are aware of stuff, they're, they're spreading information, then in sort of old news, they're no longer talking about it, it, it dissipates. So we'll run it for some number of periods, and then we'll have some iterations in terms of how likely this is to spread. So just in terms of a picture, so suppose the microfinance organization comes into this village, it finds a teacher, suppose this is the teacher in that village, it tells the teacher, look, we're a microfinance organization, we're going to offer loans, spread the news. Tell all your friends, tell them we'll be back in a couple weeks. Okay, so let's suppose that, the, that this is a village where news spreads with a probability 0.5, and uh, the number of time periods is four. So then what we could do is just simulate this and see how many people would find out about microfinance if this was the situation, okay? So as we go through, the teacher tells somebody else, now this person knows as well, that's the first period. Second period, again, we could do some random draws. This household talks to two more, the teacher talks to somebody else. And we do that for four periods after four periods in this simulation, we get 13. So that would say, okay, if we're running a diffusion process on this network, starting at this node, we get 13. We could simulate from another node, we go ahead, boom, 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 six. Okay, so this is a way of now quantifying how many households we'd find if this is the kind of simple diffusion process that's running um, from any given node. So for each node in a network, we can calculate what its diffusion centrality would be depending on these different um, characteristics in terms of the process, okay? So one, uh, now we can go back um, just relating diffusion centrality to these other notions. You can begin to see, suppose that this process just operated once, right? So if it operates just once, then the number of people I'm gonna be able to tell just depends on how many neighbors I have because it can only reach my neighbors. So if T is one, the, it, it can only spread to my neighbors. So with really short processes, this diffusion centrality is gonna look just like degree centrality. People, if I have more de degrees, I can reach more people. So on the one hand, it's gonna look like degree centrality if, if you operate once. It turns out that if T becomes large, so if T goes to infinity, then this centrality measure will converge to eigenvector centrality. So in the limit, um, you can prove that if P is at least one over the first eigenvalue of, of, this, of the network matrix, then as this thing keeps going, then this thing keeps expanding outward and eventually it'll start looking like um, eigenvector centrality. So that's a, there's a theorem there, I won't go through the details of a theorem, but but basically what this is saying is diffusion centrality on the one hand looks like degree if you're doing very quick processes. On the other hand, if you have more time and, and information can spread more, more deeply, I, you get eigenvector centrality at the other limit. And things in between are gonna look different. So as you let T span in between one and infinity, you'll get other kinds of, of features for, for the centrality measure, okay? So first hypothesis then, if we begin to think about the villages and why the microfinance organization was getting high take up in some villages and not in others, was maybe they just happened to hit, you know, in some villages the teachers and shopkeepers were very central people, in others they weren't. And so how do we measure central? One, one hypothesis is higher degree centrality of these initial injection points into a village led to higher diffusion. Another would be higher eigenvector centrality. And then we can have a third hypothesis that is higher diffusion centrality, okay? Now obviously I've sort of stacked the deck here because diffusion centrality can nest both of these other two, right? So we have to, we have to make sure that we somehow discipline ourselves in defining diffusion centrality. So in order to do this, what we did is you can prove that there's a, a certain level of P and T which distinguishes diffusion centrality the most from these other two measures. Um, and that is in particular, P being one over the first eigenvalue, and T being the diameter of the graph. So I won't go through the, the, the network logistics of this, but basically what you wanna do is you wanna find a P and a T such that you get sort of the, the most dif difference between these kinds of measures, and there's a P and a T well-defined for that. And so what we'll do is we'll look at these three different um, hypotheses and, and look at the data and see what we see. Okay. <coughs> 
So here's the first picture. Um, what is this? This is degree centrality. So here, each point is a village. And in particular, on the x-axis, we have the degree of what we call the leaders, the first people that the bank talked to, the teachers, self-help group leaders, shopkeepers. So in this village, for instance, uh, the average degree of the first households they talked to was about 22. And this is the microfinance eventual participation rate. So 22 uh, degree take-up rate, about 7 or 8%. So fairly low take-up rate. Okay. And then there's another village here, about 24, and uh, a little over um, 13%. So you, for each village, you can map out how, how connected were the first people they talked to, how much eventual take-up did you get. The average degree in the villages is about 15. So they were talking to people who were better connected on average. Um, but you see a, a negative slope and an insignificant relationship between these two. So it doesn't look like the, you know, just finding people that with higher degree made all that much difference in terms of the eventual participation. So, th so just finding people that are well connected in that sense is not the answer. If you look at eigenvector centrality, you see a positive and significant relationship. So eigenvector centrality seemed to capture more about the, those particular injection points than just looking at these first neighbor numbers uh, direct from, from degree centrality. So here you see a positive and significant relationship. If you look at diffusion centrality, um, you get a positive and significant relationship. And uh, it's hard to tell from this picture, but you get a, a tighter fit of the data. And in particular, um, if you look at regressions, you could run microfinance participation against a, a series of covariates and then different centrality measures measuring how central were the first people that they talked to. And so what you get is uh, you know, eigenvector centrality and diffusion centrality both have significant coefficients. Um, the, the units are different because the scales are different on these measures. Uh, but basically, what you, the, the more important numbers are down here. The R squared you get on the regressions, basically, you know, you get about 25% or a little more just by looking at the basic covariates of the village. And then you get up to about 30% with some of the basic centrality measures. But the diffusion centrality does capture more of what's going on. You explain about half of, almost half of the uh, variation. If you instead fit this with, um, so if you allow yourself to fit the P and the T, so imagine now you go to the village and we did this, you estimate what the P's and T's are you'll find that the P turns out to be about 0.2. So people talk to about a fifth of their households in a given period. And the, the iterations are last about three periods. So P and T turn out to be about 0.2 and three is the best estimates. If you do that, then this number goes up to about 62%. So you, you fit even more finely if you allow yourself to fit the diffusion centrality. Okay, so what's the message here? Um, the, the basic message is that the, surprisingly, from our perspective, even after a couple of years, a lot of people in these villages had still not heard about microfinance. So we went back in. If you go back into those villages and ask them how many people have heard, you'll find that 30, 35% in, in, in some villages will still just not be aware that microfinance is available in their village, even though a number of other people have participated. So households are not talking to that many other households. They talk to about 15 other households out of about 200, uh, typically. And you know, the diffusion process matters in terms of whether this institution functions. And you get wide variation across the different villages based on whether you hit the right nodes to begin with and got fairly good saturation and, and high informativeness rate or, or low rate. So you see a lot of variation in how informed people are over time. OK. So that was the first part of the study, which was just looking at you know, how does the network impact the functioning of this institution. And the second part is then afterwards, once the financial crisis hit, then we went back in, looked at what the networks look like afterwards, and then see whether we see the change in social structure responding to the availability of finance. So again, um, 2006, we surveyed all the 75 villages that they intended to enter. 2007 to 10, they entered 43 of these. Um, in 2011 and 12, we resurveyed the villages. Okay, uh, uh, one key point here, we did not randomly pick the villages that they entered. Um, from our perspective, it appears that there's no significant difference between the villages they entered and did not. 
The way that they picked the villages appears to be in terms of training their personnel. So they had different personnel attached to different villages and they trained them in a, a rotating way. Um, so it doesn't appear that there was any logic to it, but this is not a randomized control trial. So I'll do a diff and diff analysis, but that's an important caveat to the data that we have available. Okay, so if you look at the villages, these are the microfinance villages, these are the non, 43 to 32. Um, average number of connections, as I said, about 15. Uh, 13, no significant difference. These are a bunch of measures, uh, network measures. You know, clustering is how many of a given fraction, what's the fraction of my friends that are friends with each other? Um, typically in these villages, it's about a, a third. Average distance between households um, in, in network distance, um, 2.7, 2.8. You know, fraction in a giant component, how many, connect, how many households can reach other households in the village? Um, so there's a whole series of different measures we have in terms of wealth and uh, also in terms of caste, savings, et cetera. Um, and the villages look um, fairly similar. Okay, so now let's go in. What we want to do is, is say microfinance entered certain villages. They did not enter other villages. What we want to do is we want to compare what happened in the villages they entered to the villages they did not enter. We also want to see how it depended on which households got loans. So there's going to be households who got loans and households who did not get loans. Now in order to figure out which households got loans and did not get loans, in the microfinance villages we can just look and see who got loans, but to compare them to the right groups and the others, what we did was propensity score. So this is a technique by what you do is you try and it was something that's used in economics, but uh, originally was used in healthcare. You try to figure out who would have been treated had they had the opportunity. So here, um, what we're going to do is basically look at the demographics and the network positions of a bunch of households, try and predict who got microfinance based on these characteristics, and then use that to figure out in the villages that didn't get microfinance who would have gotten it if they had the chance. Okay. So, we'll, we'll, and then we'll, we'll use these propensity scores in both sets and just compare what happens to the households who, who are most likely to have gotten microfinance and the ones who are least likely to get microfinance. So, this is just the propensity scoring that we end up. So, we'll categorize people as either highly likely or less likely to get microfinance. And the probability that they actually got microfinance, when you look at these designations, it's a, a little over 46% for the highs and a little under 5% for the lowest. So we're, you know, we're about 10 times more likely for your characteristics if we call you a high to get uh, a loan than not. So that, that's fairly good in terms of being able to categorize um, these different types of households into these bins. Okay, so what happens um, in the villages that get microfinance and not? So first of all, let's look at the highs. And then what we're doing here is we're regressing um, this is uh, data we have on, on what, what their borrowing patterns look like. So after microfinance, what does their borrowing patterns look like? So this is microfinance entered, and this is afterwards, and these are numbers. So this is the diff and diff, and what this number means is that um, people who were designated as high would get about 1,800 rupees more from microfinance institutions in the villages that had microfinance than the villages that don't. Well, hopefully that you know, makes sense. These are the people that are taking out loans. The people who designated as lows, you get a point estimate of 302 that's insignificant. So they're getting, you know, some of them do get some loans. We miscategorize some of them, but they're not getting much. But you're also seeing that they're basically um, dropping. You'll see this is how much do they borrow from self-help groups? How much do they borrow from friends and family? And so you see that there's negative numbers so the highs are getting more money from microfinance. They see more or less a, a, an equal offset um, in terms of the other amounts that they're borrowing from other points. These are insignificant, um, but more or less the same magnitude. What you see from the lows is you see not much from microfinance, but you see drops in, in their other, uh, the, the where they're getting other amounts of, of money. So there's less activity in terms of their borrowing and lending, and, and I'll tell you a little bit more about that. Okay, so we've got these categorizations of highs and lows, people likely to get microfinance or not, and then we're trying to see how they're changing. Um, and basically, they're, they're getting more money from microfinance. They're all borrowing less from other sources, um, depending on which category they are in. 
Okay, so corresponding drops. Okay, now we can look at the networks themselves. What happens in, in the microfinance village versus not? So this is the density of the connections before and the density of connections afterwards. And this is the non-microfinance villages and these are the microfinance villages. So first of all, what you see is in general, there's gonna be a drop in the density. So the, the, these networks are becoming more sparse over time. Um, it's just barely significant in the non-microfinance villages. There's a significant drop in the microfinance villages. And the drop is about uh, a little more than twice as much when you go to the microfinance villages. So you're seeing, in general, these villages are, are seeing a little less social cohesion within the villages. And part of that is the fact that Bangalore is growing. It's one of the fastest growing areas in, in India. Um, there's more connections going outside the village now. So you're seeing a little bit of a drop of connectedness in there, but you're seeing a bigger drop in the microfinance um, villages than the non-microfinance villages. Okay, so link density is down, other measures of network stuff are as well. Now then we can look inside and see who's losing links. So if we look inside the villages, we have these highs, so people that are getting loans, lows, people who aren't getting loans. What's happening when we start unpacking that? Who's, who's being affected by the institu institution entering these villages? So link probabilities, um, high, high links. So these are non-microfinance, microfinance, and this is sort of the after, afterwards. So what you see is you see microfinance having fewer links among highs and highs, actually a bigger drop among highs and lows, and actually the biggest drop is lows and lows. And so this was puzzling to us for a while. Um, why is it that the people who are not getting microfinance are the people who are seeing the biggest erosion in their networks? So these people are, are, are interacting less and borrowing less from each other. And um, you know, the, uh, uh, sort of, I'm not gonna go through all the theory we have, but we've gone through a, a series of different network formation models to try and distinguish them. And effectively what it appears is that in order to tell the story, you have to have some um, interaction in terms of search among the individuals in a village. And in particular, the, if you go to the village, so I was there um, last December and, and talking to people in the villages, and the one feeling in the microfinance villages is that you know, people used to come and hang around in the town square a lot, and they would socialize. And once the microfinance came in, there was less of that going on. So the highs felt less need to go to the village square and, and talk to other people. Once the highs showed up less, then the lows showed up less, and so then you get a feedback effect and that deteriorates and you get basically everybody showing up less there. And, and in fact, the, the lows are losing links at at least as high a rate, and if not a higher rate than, than the highs. So basically, the institution changed the social interaction structure and that then led to a deterioration of the, of the link structure. Okay, um, in terms of network, then you can do sort of a, you know, model this by a, a um, meeting and maintaining links based on effort. It depends on what other people are doing. And then socializing changes the matching, changes the expected utility, changes the socializing, and, and you can you know, model this as an equilibrium and try and understand exactly what's happening. And then you know, as the highs socialize less, you get these spillovers where then this, the lows socialize less and, and it's not hard to, get, um, to match up the data with, with a simple model like this. The other thing that was interesting is um, we can break, remember we have all these different types of networks, you can break them into different types. These are borrowing and lending networks, these are the advice networks. And then no microfinance, microfinance, and again you're seeing drops, um, and these are the lows and the highs, you see a bigger drop for the lows, but you're seeing almost identical spillovers into the advice network as what you're seeing in the borrowing network. And the answer for why this is happening is that these relationships tend to be highly correlated. So often the people that I end up getting information from are also the people I'm borrowing and lending with. And so once you take the borrowing and lending relationships out, you also lose those advice relationships. So this is what's known as multiplexing in, in the networks literature. It means that we're doing multiple relationships, they're reinforcing each other and there's reasons good of incentive reasons why we do many things together with the same people. The more things we do together, the more incentives we have to keep doing them, but then once you pull one of those out, you tend to, to decrease the other ones. And so we're seeing spillovers not only into across different groups, but also ac across different types of relationships here. Okay, 
So sort of lessons on network formation. Um, there's complementarities in these different types of networks. There's spillovers generally from the entrance of the microfinance organization and sort of you might want to think of these as general equilibrium effects. So you, know, you pull out certain relationships and it ends up affecting a whole series of other ones. We move to a different social equilibrium and we see different networks than we saw before. So these links are not at all independent. Um, an imperfect search helps explain, at least gives one e possible explanation for why we're seeing such a, a, a large impact, a fairly big drop in the, in the density of the networks among these people who did not take advantage of the microfinance organization. Um, and then seeing you know, other kinds of the information network uh, deteriorating as well. Um, you know, I, I think what I would take away from this in terms of studies is that it, it, you know, something is fairly obvious on one level but important to emphasize on the other is that any kind of intervention has a lot of consequences. And in particular, it can have fairly large consequences beyond the par target population. So in this situation, there's a target population of the people that end up taking up loans, but there's a lot of people who did not have um, interest in taking up the, the loans or opportunities to, and they end up being affected uh, equally or, or even more than the people who ended up in the, in the microfinance. Um, this could increase inequality, so if you actually look at the inequality measures within the network, sort of the spread of centrality and so forth, those are increasing, and the lows are at the low end of that. So, um, you know, there, there are issues here, and I think, you know, the, the main message here is that you just need to take that into account. If, you, if you're going in, in with a policy of putting in some sort of institution that might affect social fabric, the social fabric can change far beyond the intended consequence. That doesn't mean we don't want to give them microfinance, it just means we should be aware of this in terms of understanding what the overall welfare impact might be in a village um, beyond the, the direct loans that are given. So sort of closing thoughts, um, you know, uh, networks are sort of an interesting area. There's a lot of increasingly available data, so there's a lot that can be done. They impact what people know, what opportunities they have. Um, there's fairly simple measures that we can use that actually have a lot of predictive power. So we can begin to, you know, just by quantifying things in fairly simple measures like diffusion centrality and so forth, those aren't hard to calculate. Um, they end up having good correlation in the data. And when we look at these sort of formal markets and institutions, they operate together. And understanding how they're intertwined and what the impact of one another is um, is sort of important, and I think we need better understanding of some of the consequences of these interactions uh, in the future. So I think that's a good place to stop and um, take any questions, but thank you very much. Okay, I, I guess we'll have questions, and I was gonna, I think Matt will field his own questions, so you just put up your hand and he'll call on you. Matt. Uh, so, let me say, I, I can say a couple of things about that. So, um, first of all, the, there's been a, a number of studies just in trying to understand the impact of microfinance generally, and it's not something that's easy to measure, because part of the, these, these loans are, sometimes they're used for investment in productive purposes, so people might buy, say, several families might go in together and, and buy a tractor or, or um, buy some new land. But it's also used largely for income smoothing. So these, these households face a lot of, you know, if, if they're buying most of their inputs in, say, agriculture in one part of the year and then not getting paid um, for several months after that, there, there's periods where they were basically uh, without money. And this just is, is a way of income smoothing. So I, I think you don't see a huge impact in terms of overall productivity in the villages. That's been one thing that microfinance, I mean, I know Abhijit and Esther have been looking at more, more deeply. Generally, what are the impacts of these things? There's a number of studies. And it's hard to see direct impact, but it, I think you know, a lot of it is like having credit cards. It, it helps smooth income. It helps people um, you know, deal with day-to-day -day fluctuations and month-to-month uh, -month fluctuations here, where a whole village might have lower income level for some time period. 
Sergey Gurif, I, 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 I really like this talk. Thank you very much. It's, it's fascinating and has uh, indeed direct implications for policy in develop, developing countries. My question is about the channel through which uh, microfinance may affect uh, the participation in networks that then has um, impact on those who are weakly connected to finance. So one of the stories is, of course, people don't show up to the squares because they don't need networks anymore because they already have a loan through form formal cha channels. Another one is that their opportunity cost of time is higher because their productivity is now higher, so it, uh, it is costlier for them to show up. Now, in your diff and diff and also breaking uh, the gap between high and lows, you kind of look at this question, but can you actually look at indeed directly the incomes, opportunity cost of time, and so on, to what extent development itself, raising incomes or raising wages itself, can actually reduce informal networks. I guess you, you have all the data to address this question, just look at uh, incomes or wages or something like this. Yeah, that's a very good point. And, and uh, indeed, when, when you look at it, sort of our model, you can get the same kind of effect by either increasing the opportunity cost or just decreasing the benefits, direct benefits from, from borrowing and lending or interacting with other individuals. So you're right, both of those will operate in similar ways. The data that we have currently, we don't have um, detailed enough data within households of consumption and so forth to, to actually see what the impact is. Uh, there's an, another study that I'm involved with with a group of anthropologists where we're gathering data which will have longitudinal data on very specific stuff for incomes within households and networks. And then we'll be able to answer the kinds of questions that you're asking. And I think right now, with these data, we just don't have the acuity to, to deal with that. But you're right, and it, it makes a difference because the policy implications for whether it's opportunity costs or um, benefits suggest different policies if you want to figure out how do you maintain social fabric for some of the people who aren't getting loans and so forth. There's different ways to deal with it depending on what the answer to your question is. So it's a, it's a very important question. We don't have the data here to do it. But. Uh, thank you very much. I'm name's Valentin Seidler from the University of Warwick. Um, I've been doing this actually with the Red Cross, microfinance things before I became an academic. And my gut's feeling would also be with the uh, question that we just heard, that actually these people need to get the 30%. They have to repay the loan, so they don't have time to hang out about anymore. And, and as you said, there is, um, it's very costly to keep social fabric up. It's like building a loan story from putting them a bit. No more time to hang out with the friends. But um, maybe you can show this nicely by variations in the microfinance interest rate that they have to pay. Maybe there's villages where that is lower and people can be more relaxed about paying back. And in these villages, we have a, a slower degradation of the social fabric. Have you looked into that? I see. So you're saying take a look at different, do something with different interest rates in different villages and see whether there's, yeah. Yeah, no, no, but that would be a very interesting, uh, yes, a very good suggestion. Yes, certainly. Thanks very much, that was great. Um, so if I understand your, the way your regressions are working, you're, you're explaining some of the difference between your 0% villages and your 44% villages by saying the people we actually talked to had uh, lower centrality. Um, now, is that having chosen the wrong people in the village, or is it a difference in the village that actually that was like the highest uh, rating of a person you'd find in those villages? So you've got, you've got individual level measures. What about the village level measures? Right, so um, in, it, it turns out that it's really, in, in these data, it's, it's more picking the right people within the villages and not so much the differences in networks across the villages. So one thing that we, uh, you know, when we started this study, we were hoping to see was more variation across villages in the networks. But the network variation across villages on a lot of dimensions isn't so high. So the villages actually, the bank really picked fairly identical villages in a lot of ways. And so the network structures are very, very similar across villages. And most of the variation is coming from identifying the right households. And it just happens that, you know, teachers in some households you know, are very, uh, central and, and charismatic and have lots of friends and other ones they're not and and so depending on that you end up uh, you know getting a lot of variation in in who they seeded it with but the the variation in the networks themselves is fairly minimal surprisingly I, I found um. can oh 
Is there another? Oh, sorry. Yeah, just uh, uh, two questions. First is, uh, could, could you get more out of your diffusion centrality measure by having directionality in it? So, so if I've noted that you're a guy that I go to advice, but you don't come to me for advice, then the diffusion uh, yeah, yeah. You know, may not be uh, symmetric, and I, I don't know whether you get more out of it. The, the second thing is that the structure of these loans, uh, loaned to five individuals who I understand may default at low rates, but that doesn't mean that they bicker at low rates because someone's threatening to default. And so one, one thing that I may, may have some concerns about is the structure of these loans almost certainly is going to bootstrap on an existing small network. And if they have conflict in repaying the loan, that could be what is causing the atrophying of the network uh, as opposed to um, you know, other, other factors. I don't know if there's any heterogeneity in the way that those loans were rolled out, but it would be one potential conflict. Yeah, actually, uh, I can say a little bit about the, the groups. Um, so the bank was careful not to put relatives in the same group, and also the, you know, they, they tried to match people w that were somewhat diverse into groups just for, for um, I guess, risk reasons. Uh, you do see increased friendships among the groups. So the group formation actually led to, so some of the high, high, some of the reason that the high, high doesn't drop quite as much as the lows is the fact that they formed some new friendships among some of the groups that they were put into. So if they did get loans, that forms new, actually new groups rather than uh, deteriorating ones. But we, we don't actually observe what went on within those groups and you know, whether somebody had to pay for somebody else to make sure they didn't default and so forth. So we don't have that information. In terms of using more for the diffusion centrality, you're right. You know, I think one message from this is not that diffusion centrality is sort of the right measure, but it's that it's fairly easy to, to, to develop very simple models and use those in ways to measure you know, who's central or who's not. And you can enrich it by looking at directionality. You can enrich it by using weights. So some of these households interact like five different ways, some of them 10 ways, some of them one way. You can begin to weight them. And all of those actually add to the acuity of the, of the measure. Yeah, I'm Hoàng Lương, PhD student from uh, Greenwich, London. So I'm just wondering how did you cope with the labor movement? Because I suppose that some people, when they got loan and they like got richer and they wanted to move out from the poor um, area. Yeah, so we don't we, we, we don't control a lot. I mean, so I, I guess over the six year period, there's about a 12 to 15 percent turnover in population within the villages. So there is some migration, mostly to Bangalore. There's also people who are becoming adults that, that weren't in our adults in our first survey. So we have an increase in the population overall and in some immigration. Um, and we don't have full control over that. W one of the nice things of this study was you know, when you, if you try to map out people's social networks, say in this room and try and you know, try to survey everybody, we, we, would, we would only have a fraction of the networks because the networks extend outwards quite a bit. One nice thing about these, these villages is they tend to be fairly insular. So most of the people have most of their relationships within these villages. Occasionally, they'll marry a daughter across a village or something. A lot of them, you know, there wasn't as much movement to Bangalore as you might have expected given the rise in Bangalore. So, so the, the, you know, they make nice petri dishes from a, a network perspective. But you're right. I mean, there, there is some leakage and, and people move out and, and that's something you have to worry about in these. Um, this study has less of that than most, of, most kinds of studies that you, you run into. Maybe it's a good time. Uh, one, okay, one, one. okay, last question. Yeah. Okay. Go ahead. So you, you um, emphasized the importance of the, of the initial seed, but if I understood you correctly, there were several seeds, so that we're not just talking to one teacher. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm asking what's the relation between those, right? If yeah. they are close together in a network, that may be another way to explain <laughs> heterogeneity between the networks. If they're kind of far apart, but at crucial points, I would expect more spread than when they're close together, even if they have on average higher Exactly. It's a very good point, and, and uh, a couple of words on that. One, one is, suppose you wanted to find the, the best three seeds in a village. What you wouldn't want to do is just rank them all and then pick the top three, because often those three might be very well connected to each other. And so, in fact, um, you know, there's, there's algorithms that you can use to try and figure out what the best combinations are. And you can also see in these villages, um, you get much better take up if you hit multiple cast groups. So remember the casts really split this network. If you pick the most central person from each cast group, 
you would do much better than just picking the top three cent most central people. And so there, there's very simple algorithms you can, de you can develop based on the graph and based on simple demographics that, that improve over just picking highly central people. And it does explain some of, you know, that additional variation does explain some of what was going on, and in particular, whether or not they were getting across caste groups. And some of the villages that have Muslim-Hindu splits have really strong caste groups, and if they didn't hit both sides, um, you got lower take up. Yeah. Okay, great. Well, thank you so much, uh, Matt. That was a wonderful talk, and I think ho hopefully we've all learned a great deal, and particularly you know how a new set of tools to go out and look at institutions and organizations, which I think uh, Matt has convincingly showed us has some empirical content. So I'd like to thank you very much for a great talk. <laughs>